see what works. I often think it's also a little bit like the baskets and things we have for our animals. <laughs> you know, we make them really nice and comfortable with a blanket or something. And that's why they love to go and hang out and relax. So the relaxation is one part of the practice. And we might get a bit of tiredness in the beginning, which is very normal, because we've been doing so much. Not, not so much for myself, actually. <laughs> I had a really nice and easy time here now to kind of, you know, move um, into this retreat time. But yeah, if tiredness arises, that's very normal. But then when you do it the right way, wakefulness, joy and happiness is also what will arise. But we can't force these things to arise. We have to go step by step. And that will wake us up, make us bright and happy. So if you're a bit sleepy in the beginning, no problem. We'll give some instructions for walking meditation for that. Okay. So let's go into the second ideal attitude, uh, which I coined care, caring. And as you can already see, you know, I also put some pictures there. For me, a picture which kind of brings it out quite nicely is the person putting uh, his or her arm over another, over another person and just kind of consoling expressing that care. I often find it a little bit difficult to distinguish between the first two, between kindness and care. I'll go a little bit more into detail how they can be differentiated, but it's mainly the trigger which brings up the feeling which is different. But the actual feeling itself is very, very similar. So let's have a look. Caring. We care by giving attention, and we care by connecting to another person, to an animal, or to our body. So when we do the body sweeping, when we do the body awareness, in order to find out what's going on, we have to attend to that part of the body. We have to connect to that part of the body. And you will notice that also when you are in a relationship with another person, very often we are too much in our head. We're too much in problem-solving mode. So a person comes and they say something and we try to fix the problem. We try to fix the other person. We try to fix ourselves. And we don't give enough attention. We don't give enough connection, enough opportunity to really connect to what is going on. So when we do those body sweeps or when we do meditation in general, we don't think about those difficult uh, or those different parts sorry hopefully they're not always difficult <laughs> those different parts but we actually rather feel them and sometimes a lot of people have trouble with that they come up to me and say like you know how do you do this kind of meditation and you start with your feet okay i'm thinking about my feet i know where my feet are <laughs> i can even wiggle them around but it's a different way of connecting to them. It's not an intellectual way. It's a feeling way. It's a receptive way. So it takes a bit of practice to get your head around it, you would usually say. But I have changed that to get your head, to your heart around it, to feel, to connect. So, karuna, caring. Uh, little definition that we could use. So it is the wish and it's the motivation to alleviate suffering, to alleviate something which is problematic, which is difficult. There is some um, friction or there is some um, tension, for example, and we want to alleviate that. 
And how can we kindle this kind of feeling within our own heart? So now we reflect on or we see the pain and the suffering. That is one of those things that can be very difficult. And that's why we do need metta, we need unconditional acceptance. And we also need some wisdom. But even if we don't have that, we can make sure we don't get caught up in the suffering. So we think of this last little bit that I added there, which I feel is very, very important. We think of the release from that suffering. That is our wish. So the trigger is something uncomfortable, is something unpleasant. But we want to make sure we don't get caught up, overwhelmed by that. We actually focus on where we are hoping to be sometime in the future. So it's the same thing, you know, if you're watching the news too much, you are um, confronted with so much suffering. And if you are not able to let your heart resonate with the caring part within yourself, that wishes well, then you can get swept away. And then as Aya Kema used to talk about this, she said, you have double dukkha. Dukkha is suffering. Dukkha is a problem. And you have one person with a problem and another person comes along and instead of caring and reassuring, they actually start to suffer themselves. <laughs> and then you end up with two people suffering and that's uh, not so helpful. So same thing here. I'm trying to visualize it for myself as a journey. And how does that journey look like? So we are moving from overwhelm, from inactivity. Usually when we're overwhelmed, we just don't want to do anything. We freeze, so to speak. Then we move towards acceptance, and we move towards caring. So we are kind of leaning out of ourselves a little bit. So we are moving from feeling bad for someone or with someone, as I say, we're suffering along with them, and moving towards caring and empowerment. In German, we actually have two different words. We have Mitgefühl and we have Mitleid. So Mitleid means to suffer with someone. Mitgefühl means to feel with someone, to connect and to have empathy. So you understand what's going on, but you are not um, caught in it. So when we start our journey and we are dealing with the opposite of caring, then we talk about cruelty. So we talk about this catchphrase of thinking on a thought arising, you deserve whatever is happening to you. And if we have this point of view, then we often forget all our morals, all our moral principles, and we lower another being to something, you know, yeah, basically other. And we can only be cruel if we do that. If we realize that they're actually the same like we are and have the same wishes that we have and don't want to suffer, then we can't be cruel. But if we somehow dehumanize another being, then we can slip into very unwholesome ways of thinking about them, talking about them, and then unfortunately also treating them in that way. When suffering happens, when problems happen in the world, we can often be overwhelmed or feel afraid. So then we turn away and we basically don't want to know what's going on. That can be one reaction, which I feel is already more wholesome though than the first one we had before. 
again, we can fall into things like blaming or being angry. And in this um, instance, we can blame another person or ourselves by thinking it's all their fault. And when we know Buddhism well enough, and we know of the concepts and of cause and effect, we know about anatta, we know about conditioning and all the different influences we are um, uh, influenced by, then we will realize it's never just like my fault or their fault. It's always a bigger story and we can understand that story and then we don't fall into blaming or into um, being angry. We can judge, we can shame, we can tell people, you know, I see, I told you so. <laughs> or we can say the same thing internally towards ourselves, which is not really a caring response, isn't it? When something difficult happens and we fall into behaving or thinking or talking in ways like this, we make the problem worse. And that's definitely not what we wish to do, hopefully. Then we can fall into belittling and thinking, you know, it's not that bad, it's not such a problem, don't make a big fuss, it's suffering, yes. But very often it's difficult for us to feel what's happening for another person, to walk in their shoes, so to speak. And we'll probably realize that for ourselves as well. Something which is a big deal for me might be nothing for someone else. But if someone says, this is difficult for me, let's see if we can just believe that the person is telling the truth and that it is a big deal for them. And that we try and support them in whatever they're going through rather than saying, you know, I mean, it's no problem for me. Why are you making such a big fuss about things? That way they won't learn to understand what's going on. We might be able to share some of our experiences, how we overcome things like this, uh, but belittling is not a, a wholesome, helpful response. And we might be insensitive, we might be impatient, we might be reactive when suffering or difficulty arises. So we might be telling another person or ourselves, come on, get your act together. So that is not a very healthy and helpful response as well. Helplessness, which basically has to do with fear and overwhelm there as well, where we basically internally just think, what can I do? Who am I to help? But very often, as you will find out, we don't have to do a lot, even just being with another person, connecting with another person, letting them talk about what is difficult for them is often the best thing we can do. Fixing it up and trying to cure. Ajahn Brahm often talks about caring rather than curing. So when you go to hospital, if they just want to cure you and see you as a number, then your um, chances of recovery are actually much, much smaller. And caring is something you can always do, no matter what happens. And then very often cure happens based on caring. And if it doesn't happen, some things are incurable, you can still care and you can still, as Panditchanda was saying, live with some conditions for a long period of time by alleviating them, by not making them worse. So fixing it up, the catchphrase here could be, I know you need this, you need to do this, you need to do that. So we are kind of, as I mentioned, we get into this fixing mind state of trying to manage a situation. And one other thing that, yeah, I think happened for me quite a lot in the beginning. I, I used to be a primary school teacher. I used to um, work with disabled people, with uh, blind people, with brain damaged children, uh, with blind deaf people and so forth. So I've never been a parent as such but I was in caring professions before, and I realized that sometimes when we are in caring role, we tend to take responsibility 
for someone else, and too much responsibility for someone else. Of course, when children are vulnerable and small, we have to protect them, that is our job. But when they feel bad, <laughs> it doesn't help when we feel bad as well. We want to be the person who is actually giving them a sense of safety, a sense of reassurance, and a sense of empowerment, rather than feeling responsible um, for whatever they are going through and thinking, oh, I have to carry this, or hey, I have to make it good again. So we try to help the person to grow and make it good again themselves, to the degree they, of course, can. And with, as they get older, we can give them more and more responsibility. Oops, here we go, next one. Uh, taking it on, yeah, that's kind of the same thing there. So have you noticed when you come into a situation and something is happening and someone is, you know, I don't know, it's really embarrassing or something, or <laughs> probably the best one is when, when you have a child and they are performing on the stage <laughs> and you're like the parents sitting in the audience and you're getting more nervous than the kid. The kid might be just having a, a good time on stage and you're just really... <laughs> and that can happen as well if there is something bad happening. You might be really um, feeling bad yourself. Um, the other way of um, relating, which is not so helpful, is when we feel um, pity for another person. So sometimes people don't quite understand what the unwholesome part is in here, and I try to describe it to them as you are not on the same level. When you meet another person and you fall into pity, it always kind of has a hierarchical view of the situation. I'm fine, but you are not. And that kind of whatever that called, it's called, you know, someone being lower and someone being higher, creates an unwholesome energy. So we want to go and meet the other person where the other person is as much as possible. Um, so we don't have a feeling of pity, but a feeling of empathy. So that's a little bit of the journey that we might be on when we are practicing caring, when we are practicing karuna. <coughs> And what might be some catchphrases and some ideas that represent a fairly pure or completely pure um, form of care. So we might have a genuine interest when we want to contact, connect with another person and really ask, how are you? And really mean, how are you? And we can ask the other person to tell us more, rather than trying to impose our own ideas onto them and think we know exactly what they're going through. It's that receptive listening um, quality of allowing them to speak, allowing them to describe what they're going through. Then, when we see suffering, we try to reach out. We try to ask if we can help, if we can assist. Often that is um, more than is needed. Um, listening, being silent, being attentive. I think I've mentioned that many times now. When you go and see someone in hospital who is really unwell, sometimes it's not the best to ask, how are you? <laughs> but just be with them and listen with them. And maybe even talk about something else which brings a bit of joy and happiness into their heart. And just sharing the moment with them by being silent and letting them talk. Then we're feeling, we're connecting with them, we're resonating, we're tuning into what someone is feeling. We are comforting them and reassuring them. So we let them know that it's okay, that things are not okay. Life doesn't always work out as we expect it to work out, but it will change. These things usually come and these things go to some extent. Um, we just are with the person and we let them know that they're not alone. That's something which is also very, very important for people to know who are going through a difficult um, period of time or who are suffering. They often feel they are the only one 
they often think that no one is there to support them. And we can also give them a feeling of belonging and of appreciation. Very often when something is difficult or when we are sick, we always feel, we often feel like we're a burden. We are no use. We can't do anything in this world anymore. But it's so beautiful if we can show another person that they don't have to be anyone, that they don't have to do anything in order for us to appreciate them and to give them a feeling of belonging. Okay, so that's some ways how we can think about caring. And caring and kindness, those two qualities we looked at together, we develop towards others, but we also develop towards ourselves. That's one of the pictures I found in the internet many, many years ago, and I keep, keep reusing it because I find it's a very beautiful picture of someone you know, in a very messy home, <laughs> which kind of represents life. But then um, being at ease, being at peace with themselves, being kind and caring towards themselves. I like yes. So, K. The C stands for courage and for connection. So, connection I think I've talked a lot about already, but courage is one thing which is quite important. Um, suffering can be scary, so it takes quite a bit of courage to reach out and to see what's going on. But when we muster that, then we come to the A, and we accept, and we acknowledge what's going on. So we see the suffering, and we normalize it, as they call it in psychology. We realize this is what's happening, and this is okay that it is happening. We first have to accept, before we can move forward, because otherwise we are caught up in resisting. And then we move to the R. Once we've realized that there is some suffering, we acknowledge the suffering, then we try to find the resources within our own heart or outside of ourselves to rebalance things again, to help ourselves or help another person to get out of a difficult situation. And that will also mean to reassure them. And that will allow us to gather some energy, to gather some strength, and to give the person or ourselves some empowerment. Because very often in this person we, we can feel very disempowered. Okay, I think. That is the slides I have. Yes, that's just a reminder, a mantra that might be nice for you to consider. This is a moment of suffering whenever suffering arises. Suffering is part of life. May I be kind to myself or to you in this moment of suffering. May I give the compassion I or you need. Okay. Very good. So let's do some walking meditation instructions. Is that right? And then we'll do another meditation together. Okay, so walking meditation is also a wonder way, wonderful way of practice. If we um, basically, sometimes when we sit down and meditate, yeah, our mind is still very active and there's a lot of energy within the body, yeah, especially if we're working a lot, traveling a lot, have a very busy mind and also doing a lot of going to many, many places, traveling a lot. So walking is a way, a wonderful way yeah, to allow this energy to be gr grounded within the body yeah? because sometimes when we sit down we say oh our mind is like almost like a monkey mind it goes from the past the future and all through the day yeah? so walking is great 
to just ground all those awareness to the body and to this the knowing the knowing that we are walking so maybe I'll just quick uh, do a quick demonstration so it's for the, everyone ha haven't done walking meditation before so when you do start a walking meditation you should have your hand at the front or sometimes both hand at the back but you see the front is the best so with your eyes down maybe about a meter or two meters then just gently raise the right leg step forward and just place it down then the left leg move up gently and put down so the main thing is basically to be aware of the sensation of the movement of your leg and the next leg so you can walk slowly or just normal pace so when we reach the end of the room we stop then we gently bring turn around then we start over again right leg then left leg I'd like to use my toe just a few and step nice and quietly because sometimes I notice some people when you do walking meditation they can like stomp and it's, it might disturb a lot of people around so I use the toe so it's nice and quiet and stop then turn around the beneficial benefit of using walking meditation is we have a very busy mind we just walk and bring the awareness to our feet and just watch the whole emotion the movement of the body walking back and forward because one thing we find if you do a lot of walking meditation you find that after a while your mind will slowly calm down then your awareness will be placed will be just fully aware of our step left and right the movement and the touching and if you do do a lot of walking meditation and you find that when your mind is calm and you're mindful then it becomes like automatic it's like your body just doing it by itself without any input because you're just walking back and forward for a few minutes or even up to an hour or half an hour and for people that practice walking meditation for a long time they find that after a while they feel like they're floating and very light the whole body becomes lighter and it is floating from left and right back and forward so that's the benefit of walking meditation it can really bring our awareness to this body and to what the whole movement then the mind becomes calm and peaceful so once it's calm and peaceful then you can stop and just do sitting meditation then it's easier to um, stay with the body allow the body to slowly disappear and stay with the breath so that's the benefit of walking meditation when I was a lay person I used to work very hard so when I come back home and then I can sit I would do a lot of walking meditation and it's great it's really really calm the mind down and go to you anything to add in? Oops. Uh, I think it's good. Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's on. Uh, no, all good. Um, the walking meditation, we've opened the door on the side room over there. And I put the air conditioning on there as well. And uh, also, um, if probably five people might be maximum there. But there's a big hall just one level down where you could also be doing walking meditation if you like. So if we can, uh, if people do go down afterwards, then put on the light and, well, maybe we don't need light, but have the air conditioning on there. But what we were planning to do is to just do a guidance into meditation. So what's the difference between a guided meditation and a guidance into meditation? So when we do a guidance into meditation, we will just give you a bit of guidance for, I don't know, it depends, maybe 10, 15 minutes and then let you meditate by yourself and then you can 
to sit quietly for a longer period of time, or when you feel you're still a bit tired and you still need a bit of activity, you can actually get up and do some walking meditation in the room next door or in, in the hall downstairs. Just in terms of timing, so um, we are aiming to have a Q&A session at 11. So uh, we also have the Q&A box somewhere, is that right? It's at the back? Okay, yeah, on the back table there. And there should be um, pieces of paper and pens around. Uh, over there, yes. So you can write down your questions. That way it might be a bit easier for us to read them out and answer them, so we don't have to pass the microphone around. But uh, there will be another Q&A session um, in the afternoon as well, where we can pass the mic around. And yes, and afterwards we have lunch. I think that should be pretty much it. And, and that's all clear? Yep. So when you are um, moving around to go into some walking meditation, please do that very gently and kindly and quietly if you can, to maintain a quiet environment for the people who wish to carry on sitting. Also, if you have a question, you can just quietly go and write it down. So we try to maintain noble silence as much as we can to encourage the peace to grow in the heart. Okay, please. Okay, so if you like to, you can sit down on the chair or on the floor. And we always start off just to make ourselves comfortable. And for some that like to start walking meditation, please, they can start earlier. Because some people have been practicing meditation for like quite a long time or maybe many, many years. So it's sometimes good to do some walking. And for those that like to sit, they can also do some sitting meditation. Okay, so we always start off the sitting comfortable. And you can always start off with gently closing your eye. With our eye closed. And it's always good to just take a couple of deep breaths. Just breathe in and breathe out. And breathe in and breathe out. And just relax. And relax. Then we it's always best to ground our awareness within the body. So the amount of awareness we need to apply to mindfulness, to knowing, it says when we sit here, we know that we are sitting on the cushion, we know that we are listening to my voice, and if you bring your awareness, then you know that you are breathing in and breathing out gently and quietly and that's the amount of awareness you need to know in order to calm the mind and body it's just because in some retreats they say concentrate I find that too forceful so just quietly mind mindfully knowing you're sitting and knowing you're listening and knowing your breathing. That's the amount of effort required to practice. Now mindfully sitting down on the chair, we gently bring our awareness to the whole body. And we relax the body and we always start off, not all the time, you can start off from bring awareness from your feet or from your head, but I like to start from the head. So gently bring your awareness to the top of your head and we relax our forehead and now we bring your awareness to our face we relax our face relax our eye socket relax our nose and now we relax our jaw and our cheek. And 
now we gently bring awareness to our throat and if you need to just relax your throat and if you need to you can always swallow and just make your throat comfortable because we don't hold any tension in our throat <coughs> so if you need to you can always gently cough and just swallow any saliva and just relax our throat and now we bring our awareness to our neck make sure it's nice, it's nice and straight but not too rigid then we relax our neck and now we gently bring our awareness to our upper body make sure our upper body is not stiff especially our left and the right soldier make sure our arm socket is nice and comfortable and relax both our arm socket make sure it's nice and loose not st stiff or raise up and now we gently bring our awareness to our right arm and if you need to please move it around and make it comfortable and then we do the same with our left arm move it around make it comfortable and then we gently bring our awareness to both our hands and if we need to move it around loosen it and make it relax and at ease our fingers and a palm and now we bring awareness back to our upper spine and we notice any tight area close our upper spine and just relax relax our upper body, upper spine our spine should be nice and straight but not too rigid and just relax our upper spine or back then gently move your awareness slowly down to our middle spine or back and just relax relax our back and now we can move it down gently down to our lower back or spine where it's sitting on the cushion and if you need to, please care for it. Move it around. Make it comfortable. And relax. Our lower, lower spine. And now, we bring awareness to our tummy. Make sure it's not too tight and not too stiff. And if you need to, you can just move it around, loosen our waist, and relax our tummy and our waist. And now, we bring our awareness down to our right leg. Make sure it's comfortable, it's not tight, it's nice and relaxed, and not stiff. We relax and loosen our right leg. Make it comfortable. And now we gently bring our awareness to our left leg. And we do the same thing too. We move it around. Make it comfortable and loose. And we relax our left leg. And finally, we bring our awareness all the way down to both our feet. Our feet is the part of our body we work the hardest. When we wake up in the morning, 
we use the toilet, we go to the kitchen, and we sit down, and also when we go to work and come back. So it's the best time to really relax our feet. So just move it around. You can move your toes around. Make it comfortable. Then relax both our feet, our ankle, our sole of our feet, and our toe. We really, really give our feet some time just to relax and at ease. And now we can bring our awareness back to our whole body and just notice any part of our body that's still a bit stiff or tight and if you need to just move it around and just relax relax the whole body from our head down to our upper body then down to our tummy and our back all the way down to our both our legs and our feet and also our hands and arms we feel our body and we relax this body with the body relax we care for it we make peace and we relax, relax and let it go once the body is nice and comfortable and relax we gently bring our awareness back to our face okay okay so we gently Watch our breath, just breathing in and breathing out, calmly and peacefully. Sometimes it's good to remind us when we breathe in, we breathe in peace and we breathe out relax, peace and relax, peace and relax. Meditation is basically learning to calm and relax the body. When the body is nice and relaxed, then we slowly calm and make peace with the mind, with our thoughts, with our emotion. We tend to be very, very busy, but now it's the best time to really relax this body and to relax our thoughts and our emotion. Meditation is not about stop, stopping thinking, it's just calming our mind, especially our thoughts, make it calm, quiet and peaceful. And we use our breath to calm our thinking and make peace with the moment. you find if there's any tension within the body just gently relax it once your body is relaxed then you can gently bring your awareness back 
to the breathing. Enjoy the next 15 minutes of this quiet time. 